Uh, good afternoon. <clears throat> Whoever put the display here, that it's really, really beautiful. I just wanted to mention that Penny was talking about that too. She wants to know if she can take that trumpet, don't you? <clears throat> no, you don't. But I had to I'd rather embarrass her than myself. You know how that goes. I'll pay for it later. Yeah, I wanted to mention, uh, yeah, we'll be, Trump is looking forward to that. Then we're going to be out of town for a while, God willing. We'll be back uh, the end of October. We'll be going to visit my daughter and family in Kansas City, be there next Sabbath, and we'll be in Houston for atonement and see my son and daughter-in-law, and then the feast, and then we're going to head to Kentucky for a little while, so we should be back in uh and then after we get back, uh, you know, I don't want you to think we quit attending or staying home, but we, we've we got a uh, few things that have come up. I, I know I'll be helping Mr. Beam um, a little bit more in Birmingham and Tupelo, but then once a month, been asked to go to uh, Gadsden to help Rick Bean out once a month. And then once a month, I think we'll be going to Nashville or Murfreesboro to help out Gary Petty. <laughs> Then once a year, we'll be back here. No, <laughs> no, no, we should be here at least once a month. But we haven't gone anywhere. <clears throat> All right. Well, you know, the topic I was going to cover today, it may seem a little bit, uh, what's the word I guess you could say, odd to be speaking on this right before the joyous time of the feast and all. <clears throat> and uh, But I, I, th I, I like to think that I kind of can... Uh, understand what's going on in our country and in the world and some of the things we all deal with. <clears throat> I think it's something that would be good to be covered here. Uh, so I thought I'd start off by mentioning a story, a true story. When I was living in California back in the 70s, <clears throat> mid-70s, there was something strange <clears throat> that was happening in the area in East Los Angeles, up near San Bernardino, uh, which is sort of up in the mountains, part of this was out off to themselves, this area. But automobile drivers, I can't remember exactly which, it wasn't an interstate, but one of the California highways, <coughs> the numerous uh, drivers were, were reporting that someone was throwing rocks at their cars, and certain ones were getting hit. Now, there was not like... Uh, you know, no one was dying or there was no, uh, uh, you know, thing like that. But it was just something like, well, who would throw rocks uh, at cars? And uh, they finally caught the man. His name was James Horton. I remember this so well when it happened. And uh, they talked to James after they arrested him <coughs> for what he was doing. And he mentioned how <coughs> when he grew up, he was a loner, he said. And then he became a hobo. And then he decided after a while, being a hobo was still around too many people. And so he moved up into the mountains of Southern California up in uh, near San Bernardino. And he would come out uh, and just uh, throw rocks at cars. And it doesn't seem to make any sense to, you know, the normal person. But, you know, when they talked to him a little bit longer, he described how he said, that the, one of the reasons he threw the rocks at cars was he wanted people to know that he was around, he was alive. Uh, now, yeah, it doesn't make sense normally, but he said he wanted to be noticed. Now, basically, what he said was he was very discouraged and depressed, and the way that he responded to that was throwing rocks at cars. Then he was arrested, and you know I don't really know what happened to him after that. I'm sure it wasn't uh, <clears throat> the worst uh, situation anyone have to deal with uh, legally. But <clears throat> you know I think uh, subject I want to cover today is depression and discouragement. Now we live in a world, and we live in a country that is uh, quite a bit gone off the rails. I think it's safe to say. And there's a lot of things going on that, quite frankly, when I look around, it's hard to understand. Now, I, I, when Matt Jenkins was talking about that situation at Vanderbilt Medical Center, I, I saw that on the news uh, the other night. And when I was in healthcare, Vanderbilt University was uh, my, the, my best account. And uh, they were pretty challenging, but they were a very good account. And there are a lot of nice people 
that work there. But then you see things like like what's happening here now, and it just doesn't even seem to make sense how our country and how our world and how what is going on, it's just not normal what's happening. Now, there are a number of reasons why people have feelings of doubt and depression, discouragement, and uh, I want to take a look at that subject today because I think it affects so many people and it affects to some degree, you know, all of us from time to time. Now, I'm not saying I'm not the type of person, you know, how you have people have big highs and I'm kind of just kind of go, if you looked at my chart on the thing, it's like, well, he's alive. You know, it's just just kind of, well, I, I'm actually kind of glad I'm that way, kind of glad I'm that way, I guess. But, uh, you know, it's just, it's just, but make no mistake, life is hard. And, and when you get in these situations, it certainly in no way means you're a bad person. It doesn't mean you're not a Christian. It just means it's hard sometimes. And it really is hard. Life is not always easy. Now, people, you know, I've been a pastor. I'm not now, I'm just, but I've been a pastor and I had numerous people talk to me about uh, discouragement. And uh, I take it very serious because it's very easy <clears throat> to be discouraged. Just look around and see what's happening. Uh, I know I was talking to a friend. Uh, this is totally off the subject, but uh, he said, I don't even, he said he didn't even look at his 401k anymore because he doesn't want to know how much money he's lost. Now, that is really true, isn't it? Some people's entire uh, you know, life as far as physical things and things like that are just being, to some degree, uh, wiped out, not completely. But what is going on? What is going on? Now, we're about to go to the feast. And it's a wonderful time. I, I'm so looking forward to going to the feast. And those of you that are going to the feast, I know you're looking forward to it. But yet, it doesn't change the fact that we live in a world that is very, very fragile. And there are things going on that don't make sense. And there's, uh, it's, 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 it's a tough time. Now, I had two points to start with. First point's very easy to see. The second point might need just a little bit of uh, uh, explanation. But if, number one, if you're discouraged, if you're depressed, it's not God's fault. Now, we, we know that. God gave us life. And how wonderful is that? So I think we all know that intellectually. But the other one, if you're depressed or discouraged, it's not the church of God's fault. No, it's not. But let me explain that a little bit. Of course, God's church, God's doctrine is all perfect, is it not? But people in God's church can make you very discouraged at times. You know, I had a good, uh, look at all the things we've been through over, over the last number of years. <clears throat> the, the hurts, the, the heresies that have popped up from time to time. Uh, it's not the church's fault, but people, human beings, have caused a lot of heartache and a lot of pain by the way they've acted. And uh, I had a good friend who's, who's a pastor right now told me that he was so discouraged once he just sat in his chair for hour after hour asking what's going on. Now, that was a while back when that happened. But, but, but again, it's not God's fault, all the, the problems. And it's not the church's fault, although people inside the church, uh, sometimes it, uh, you know, they, if you haven't been hurt by someone, then you're, uh, you're very fortunate. So let's take a look at where depression and discouragement really started here to begin with. Turn back to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> Again, might say, well, why would I just cover this right before the happiest time of the year? But I think it's something that wouldn't hurt for us all to, to consider uh, because 
things are not getting any better in the world physically and spiritually for that matter uh, in, in our society. Now, I could, I could read, uh, well, I'll read a few verses here. Verse 1 of Genesis 3, it says, The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And, of course, we know what happened where Satan confused Eve. Then Eve uh, told Satan, Well, we're not supposed to eat. We can eat of any tree of the garden but not that tree in the midst of the garden, which God said to stay away from. Don't eat it. Don't even touch it, he said. And then Satan, of course, said, well, you're not going to die. Just kind of laughed about what God had said. And he said, God knows when you eat that, your eyes are going to be open and you're going to be just like God. And in a sense, that's true. Her eyes were open. Adam's eyes were open and they decided they were smarter than God. And look at what the result was. Not good. <clears throat> now, notice here, you know, how Adam and Eve, they hid from God and this, that, and the other. But let's drop down to chapter 4. Let's look at Cain for a moment. <clears throat> because here was paradise, which was being uh, pretty much dis disrupted here because of Satan and, and sin. Uh, Genesis chapter 4 Adam, verse 1, Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. And she, so she had a child. And then she bore again, this time it was Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but a, a Cain was a tiller of the ground. <clears throat> now in the pro, And you know the story, but let's consider it here. Uh, in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. And Abel brought of the firstlings of the flock and their fat. And God, the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but did not respect Cain his offering. And all I can say on this is Cain did not have the proper offering. Let's leave it at that. You know, we could, I could analyze things more. But bottom line is Cain did not have a proper offering. Now, so God didn't respect Cain's offering. So what was Cain's attitude after he wasn't respected? Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, Cain? Why is your countenance fallen? Or why are you, why are you acting like this? If you do well, Cain, you'll be accepted. But if you don't do well, he told Cain, sin lies at the door. And you don't want that to happen, Cain. It's just not going to go well. And its desire is for you. Satan desired to see Cain, see old Cain fall, did he not? But he said, Cain, you should rule over it. Rule over it. Well, you know what happened. Cain talked to his brother and killed Abel. Now, I could read on, but it's verse 13. So here what God told Cain was going to happen, and Cain said to the Lord, this punishment is greater than I can bear. Well, Cain's the one that killed his brother. Cain's the one that didn't listen to God when God told him what he needed to do. But rather than repent, Cain says, I, I can't take this. Can't take it. So I think we see here clearly sin causes guilt. It caused guilt to Adam and Eve, and it should cause guilt. You have a conscience. And when you or I sin, we should listen to our conscience because it's not, it's not the way it's meant to be. Now, we all make mistakes. I mean, none of us are, <laughs> are even more close to sinless, but, but sin does cause guilt. And it can cause defensiveness, like it called, we saw Adam and Eve being very defensive, hiding. And we see Cain trying to justify himself. And it can turn into <clears throat> discouragement and depression. Now, I don't mean if someone should call me and say they're discouraged that I would say, well, you sinned. We all sin. We all sin. Now, there's different types of sin. We all make mistakes. And God is very merciful. And when you or I or someone is discouraged or 
uh, depressed. Doesn't mean you're doesn't mean you're a bad person. Doesn't mean you're not a Christian, and it doesn't even mean you've necessarily done anything wrong. It's just the fact that it's a hard life is hard, and it's tough. But God wants us to find ways to deal with things that are hard, things that are bothering us as a human being. Now, over in I think I turned to Romans chapter 3. I believe I have, know where that is. I said I know where it is. It's not necessarily my notes, but I think I know where it is. I better know where it is or we'll have a long sermon. <clears throat> Romans 3. When I, read, when I read these verses, it's amazing. But here's what I need to think about for myself. You need to think about for yourself. And verse 10 of Romans 3 says, as it is written, these are quotes from Psalm, there is none righteous. None of us are truly righteous. None of us are sinless. None of us are worthy of eternal life because of inherent goodness that we have. Because we, we, we're, we, we're thankful we have a Savior. We're thankful we have a God and a, the Son of God who cares about us, who understands what we're going through. I could turn to Hebrews. I won't. But uh, he under, they understand what we're going through. And they understand when it's hard. But it said there is no one righteous. No, not one. Only Jesus Christ and God the Father are what you can could really call righteous because they're perfect. They don't sin. There is none who understands. I don't understand everything. You don't understand everything. I don't understand why things happen in life sometimes. You don't understand why things happen in life. I don't understand when my uh, penny's son died in a car wreck. I don't understand that. I don't have to understand it. Because God will write it all in the, in the end. So I don't have to understand. You don't have to understand totally why uh, I have a real good friend, a very good friend, that had cancer, and they were doing a lot better, and now they have cancer again. And I don't understand that, why they have to go through this, but yet the end result is going to be eternal life if my friend stays faithful. And God may completely heal my friend. But if not, you know, we're all physical human beings, are we not? We long for the kingdom of God, eternal life, a spirit body. Could, I could delve off into that, but I want. So there's none who totally, completely seeks after God. There's no perfect person that never makes mistakes, in other words. They've all gone out of their way. They've all together become unprofitable. Sometimes I look at myself and say, I'm not profitable at times. <clears throat> I'm not the finished product. I'm not what I can say, oh, look to me. You don't want to look to me. Now I strive to obey God, and I'm confident that I'll be in God's kingdom as long as I stay faithful. But none of us are totally the finished product, are we? No, that's why we need a Savior. In fact, here it says there's none who does good. Now, we do a lot of good things, hopefully, but we're not what we consider, I guess you could say, the finished product. Now, there is so much going on in the world today that makes so little sense. <clears throat> you know, I look at our school system. I remember when I went to school, and it wasn't perfect, but, man, the things that the teachers dealt with when I was a kid, when I went to school, it's so far, what's going on today is, is so far uh, just continuing march toward almost oblivion. I, I have a good friend. I remember when I used to work in healthcare. I, I always remember this. It was so ridiculous. It was almost funny, but it really isn't funny. <clears throat> but he and I were talking on the phone uh, I was at one of my accounts, and he was at one of his accounts, and he was just taking a walk <clears throat> around the hospital, uh, outside the hospital. He said he came by this, there was two young people, they're probably around 20 or so, and uh, there was a, you know, male and a female, and, 
evidently they were dating each other. And one of them, he said, was telling the other one about how he cheated on her. And, uh, and she, you know, said he was cheating on her. And he said, yes, I was. And I had these other women. And, and uh, you know, but here was the bizarre part. He said that he heard it with his own ears. He said he didn't know whether to laugh or cry. He said, he, you know, I'm sorry. And she says, oh, no, that's no problem. I'm just so proud that I've got a man that's had so many different women. Does that make any sense at all? He said he thought, is that not true? In fact, it's my friend that you know. <clears throat> he said, she said, I'm so proud that you have so many women that I could be part of your harem or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> the stuff doesn't even make it so far out there that you just have to shake your head. Now, there are so many things going on in the world. You know, there are so many, and there are so many sexually transmitted diseases today that it's an epidemic we seldom hear a whole lot about. It's, it's, it's very, very bad. And, uh, but you know, you, you see on TV and you'll see all these, uh, yeah, I've got some people down here probably, <laughs> I guess they're past, past prime. I don't know why I j jotted these names down. Lindsay Lohan, Britney Spears, Paris Hilton, Anna Nicole Smith, and all these, you know, famous people, Madonna. And they seem so, I don't think they sound impressive, but to the society, they seem to be so impressive. But what, why are they so important in the news? Why, why does the news spend that much time talking about how important they are? You know, they are, there's no telling what uh, diseases they may have, some sexually transmitted diseases. There, there's no telling some of the, the filth that by all the crazy things that, that we see out there that they do. There's no telling how messed up their physical bodies are as well as their mental capabilities. You know, there are so many <clears throat> sexually transmitted diseases, and I just sort of got off on that. But I just jotted a few down. You know, bacterial vaginosis, chlamydia, genital HPV, genital herpes, gonorrhea, hepatitis B, pelvic inflammatory disease, not to mention AIDS and, and all types of things. You know, just genital herpes alone, there are 45 million people that have that disease. Now that disease, in the United States, one in five adults, it says, has that. Now, of course, if somebody has that disease, it doesn't mean they they can't repent, but it's it's it doesn't go away. There's no there's no vaccine for it. There's no uh, there's just no cure. They have to live with it. Doesn't make them a bad person if they messed up and going on. But what is this going on here? That we we don't hear that about the famous people. We don't hear that about the movie stars, the rock stars, the athletes that are out there uh, swapping around here and there. So what are they doing to their minds? And what are we doing to our minds and our body when we live like this? Do you not think those people have to have some feelings of guilt? I would hope. But yet they try to push that off, don't they? But yet, what do people do? oftentimes when they are discouraged, depressed, well, they come up with all these things to get their mind off of it. They oftentimes they they get into alcohol, they get in, or you know, excessive alcohol, they go into drugs, they go into all types of things, they go into pornography. And yet, if that affects a person, what do they need to do? They just need to say, this isn't working and turn to God and find other uh, ways because escape is not the answer. I have a good friend that I went to college with, a doctor. He's retired now. 
<clears throat> but I went to see him, you know, went to the same college, University of Tennessee, and he, he was telling me how he has so many patients that come over the long list of medications, and he'll tell them, they'll tell him they want him to heal them. Now, hey, I have to take medication for my blood pressure. I used to think, well, man, I can't believe I'd have to, but I have to take medication for my blood pressure. Because when I don't, my blood pressure spikes up. So, yeah, I'm not in any ways against medication. You know, I worked in healthcare hospitals for much of my life. So there are medications people have to take. That's not the point. But people, some people take so many different things just to try to make it through life, I guess you could say, to try to deal with their doubt, depression, their discouragement. There's so much going on. There's a friend of Penny's that she really hasn't seen in years, but she grew up with her. <clears throat> this particular person, she wanted her doctor to prescribe Prozac, I believe, and uh, which is an antidepressant drug. And there's certain people, you know, there's certain, uh, again, I'm not saying it's not right to take certain medication. It's pres prescribed in the right, proper way. But this particular person went to a doctor and he told her, because she didn't really have any specific uh, reasons, he told her to just grow up and accept some responsibility. The doctor said, so she went to a walk-in clinic, got another doctor to prescribe it. Then she would go to a different doctor and she had all these doctors to the point she was taking the largest dose that you could possibly take, probably even more than, than could possibly be recommended by any normal doctor. And you know what her husband, and she was also doing other things. You know what her, you know what her husband said? And again, we haven't seen either of them in, in years. But her husband said she li he liked it. He said, number one, she yells less to the kids because she's stoned out. She is calmer, not as irritable. And she's more fun to be around. That's what the husband said. But, but is that what we need to be so out there that we don't even hardly know where we are? The fact is, she was basically stoned out of her mind much of the waking hours with all the stuff she was taking. So what's the point here? Well, there's a lot going on beneath the surface. There's a lot going on <clears throat> out there you know some of our politicians we look at them and some of the things they say and I, at a time i thought man i hope they're on something i hope they're not this is the normal them uh you know it's kind of funny but it's not is it you know it said that 75 percent of all antidepressant drugs are sold in the united states why because we have more money you know if you lived over in some countries they don't have the money for some of these situations. So what can we do to fight? Because <clears throat> again, I, I don't want to misrepresent this. We all go through times where it's hard. Life isn't easy. And, and, and when people get older, they have uh, things they have to deal with sometimes. But uh, I remember my daughter, <clears throat> it's a wonderful daughter now, but when she was, I don't know, she's like, 15 or 16 and she went to a doctor uh, and and they said to put her on riddle and calm her down well we didn't but uh, it's like the first step sometime is just take something to just I say mellow you out but it does it really mellow you out no I think the prescription that I would recommend here is found in, is found in Ephesians. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> Again, <clears throat> unless I have not made myself clear, we all are in a world that's falling apart. We're all in a world that has a lot of issues. We're all in a world that can get very, very hard at times. Very, very easy to get discouraged. And it is discouraging to see what's happening to our country. It is discouraging to see what's... Uh, I know when, when, when Penny and I retired, I guess you never really retire. Doesn't seem like I have, but... Uh, but uh, 
Now, when they start telling me to go to Alaska, that's when I say, okay, that's, that's, that's far enough, but you can't drive there. But uh, I have no idea where I even came up with that. But uh, <coughs> there was something in there, but I already forgot it. Ephesians chapter 4. <coughs> Here's what I think is something for us to think about. Here's what Paul says to the Ephesian church. Begin in verse 23, sort of jumping into a uh, set here. Verse 22. Verse 21. I won't say verse 1 because it would go over time. <clears throat> verse 20. But so you have not learned... But you have not so learned Christ. You think, why did he start in verse 20? I have no idea. But here's verse 21. If indeed you've heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. So, you know, Jesus Christ is perfect. That you put off concerning your former conduct. That's what happens when we come into the church. I could go back to Ephesians 2, and, and it talks about we all... We're out there floundering around before God called us. Put off the old man, <clears throat> which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new man or new woman, which, which was created according to God in righteousness and true holiness. So number one, we just read, put off the old person. The old man, the old woman. That old way of life when all these things we may have done <clears throat> that we're against. Now, the old man to whom Paul refers to is our unconverted self. <clears throat> and the individual acts of sin that spring from it. When we just ran to and fro and didn't even think about God. Yet, if you only put off the old man or the old woman, the process of overcoming is not complete. We can put off the old ways but, as I just read in verse 24, put on the new person. <clears throat> the person that has a different way of thinking. <clears throat> that wants to live God's way. Because it was created according to God. If we put on the new person, and when, you, when we're baptized, we have God's Holy Spirit. Of course, we're still a human being that has a physical frailties. <clears throat> but we have a new mind. We want to be like God. God, we want to be like Christ before we don't even think about it in most cases. But yet, the new person, created according to God, notice, in righteousness and true holiness. People can talk about holy, holy, holy. You know, they can go, oh, I love God. <clears throat> but when they don't live and try to live God's way, they're not putting on the new man or new woman. <coughs> they're just putting on a facade. So we must focus not only putting off the old person, but putting on the new person. And as I read there, which is created according to God, in righteousness and true holiness, really true godliness. Not fake religion, but true religion. Now here's some examples of what we put off. And what we put on. Therefore, put away lying. <clears throat> Our society has, it's more than an epidemic. It's a tidal wave of issues. People lie constantly. Think nothing of it. They'll look you right in the eye. And they'll just lie. And it says, put off lying. You know, I have a, I know a friend that's a minister who said a person came to him once, admitted they had a problem with lying and needed help. The minister was talking to me and kind of laughed and said, well, if they said they're a liar, how do I know they weren't lying when they said they want me to help them put off lying? <clears throat> I mean, it's kind of sends your mind in circles. But put off lying. Each one speak truth with his neighbor. <clears throat> For all members of one another. You know, I find it amazing. I find it amazing how uh, 
when you buy a car now, we had to buy a car, and we figured it would get a new car because used cars are in some ways almost as expensive as some of the lower priced new cars. But but I, I they have a sticker price. It used to be you would go below the sticker price. Now it's they mark it up from the sticker price. Thinking, why do they do that? It makes no sense. Well, I guess it does to them, but uh, they're making a lot more money. But it just doesn't seem to make sense, does it? For all members of one another. <clears throat> so, have you ever had anyone that you've ever been to church with over the years that lied to you? We had our administration lying to us, didn't we, years ago, saying they weren't changing anything. I can tell you a lot of things that I won't go into now that I was privy to that, quite frankly, was a flat-out lie. And when you see that, you've got to realize, how do I trust someone that would lie to me? We can't lie to one another. We just can't. It says, be angry. <clears throat> You know, I was very angry when I found out someone would lie to me in administration that would lie to me and say they were doing one thing and really always intended to do just the opposite. So it's right to be angry, but do we not pray for healing and, and help? Don't give place to the devil. What did Cain do? God told Cain, you better get control of your attitude because if you don't, sin lies at the door. And Cain even murdered his brother. How can you... What can you say? <clears throat> Let him who stole steal no longer. I can't even remember when I was a little kid in high school. I thought I was pretty big then. But I remember going into some, uh, I don't know, it's a Walgreens or a CVS or some, some drugstore. And this friend of mine, when we came out, he said, look what I stole. He just stole some book. It looked like it was a Harlequin romance or something. I thought, why would he steal that? He didn't want to read that book. He just wanted to show he could steal it. And I'm all nervous. As I was, you know, we're going to get in trouble because I was with somebody that stole something. <laughs> But he just stole that book just to be able, just to say he stole it. He wasn't going to read that. And people steal all the time in so many different ways. But rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give who has need. Then dropping down, verse 29. Put, here's how you put on the new person. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. This anger and fighting and fussing and arguing and look at our society, look at our politicians arguing back and forth. Now you've got to stand up for what you know is right. That's not the point. There's things that are right and things that are wrong and a lot of it you can see clearly. But yet, this, but no corrupt communication. But what is good for necessary edification? Why? Why? that it may impart grace to the hearers. Don't you love a person that's an encourager, that wants to help, that wants to encourage you? So we're going to go through situations where we get discouraged, we get uh, you know, down a little bit. Do we not want to help each other with that? Instead of crit criticizing and saying, what's your problem? We all have various things that we're dealing with. And God knows we all need to help each other. Because he who thinks he stands, beware, lest he or she fall. None of us are the finished product. Verse 30. <clears throat> and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. When God gave you his Holy Spirit, he sees a new person, a new being. He sees a future member of the family of God. And then he kind of goes, let all bitterness. We need to not get bitter. Let all wrath, let all anger, let all clamor, let all evil speaking be to put 
away from you. With all malice, is there not a lot of bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking going on out here? Yes. And be kind to one another. Tender hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ also forgave you. <clears throat> we are all in this together. We need to do what we can to help each other, encourage each other. Because life is tough. Life is hard. We need to keep our mind on the goal. God's goal is for us to be in his kingdom, to have eternal life. So sometimes we're going to be sad. Oftentimes we're going to be less buoyant. We may even get discouraged and even depressed to some degree. And a clinical depression is more than just being sad. It involves severe symptoms, biological changes, but minor episodes of depression, disappointment, hopes fail, materialize, frustration results, that's part of being a human being. Things will not always go our way. But don't go to those crutches. Don't go to those crutches of things that will bring you further away. Things like, you know, dealing with wrong things like pornography and, 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 and watching things that are just bad for you and reading things that are bad for you. Now, <clears throat> this last part of the sermon here, I've got a few things here. Here's a, a book by a man named Peter Bregan, B E. B-R-E-G-G-I-N. He wrote a book, uh, the title was Talking Back to Prozac. <clears throat> he, he mentioned this, and this, here's a quote. He said, many people go through life with what might be called a low-grade depression. They're apathetic, and life seems monotonous with nothing to look forward to. There are no highs anymore, nothing to delight the senses, the heart, or the mind. Life may not seem utterly dark, but it's gray to certain people. Lacking in energy, seemingly unable to find any brightness in life, life becomes a treadmill of boredom and bleakness, and that can happen. I know people that are great people, but they're just going through a hard time. And what can we do to help them? Sometimes they just need a friend. Sometimes they just need a little help, encouragement. As a result, though, he said, sometimes they turn to such things as illicit sex, drugs, alcohol, pornography, in an attempt <clears throat> to find relief, but that only leads to deeper problems. Now, here's a few brief thoughts that I jotted down here <clears throat> that you might want to think about to help you overcome discouragement at times. Number one, Alter your routine. Find a hobby or another interest. You know, alter your routine. Find a hobby. I know somebody that was discouraged, and an older person. Well, they're older than me, but not that much older. But uh, <clears throat> but we said go out there and you know work at a hospital as a as a volunteer. Just do something to get out there and just get out of the house and not just sit around. Uh, uh, Bregan in this book I, I, I mentioned on page 204 says depression is especially responsive to changes in circumstances like making a new friend, adopting a pet, learning a new skill, joining a church, traveling or participating in volunteer or farm work. Try getting ways like you could uh, write cards, visits, phone calls. I mean, there's no magic pill, but yet things to do. Bregan said in this book, the volunteer work seems to be particularly helpful. He said a study of 3,000 people reported that 95% of them experienced experience increased optimism after volunteering. So that's one thing. I'll have to find a routine. Number two, begin a program of regular physical exercise. Exercise has been shown to increase self-confidence and lead to less depression. Again, Get out and walk or what? just whatever you can do. Just get a little exercise. Don't just sit around. Uh, some people can't get up and exercise. They're physically incapable of doing that because of their health. But if you can, try to exercise a bit. Number three, 
So just a few points here as we tend to wrap this up. <clears throat> Research has shown, number, this is number three, that diet plays a role in psychological well-being. For example, highly refined, high sugar foods have been linked to depressive tendencies. You know, I love haagen ice cream. Now, I'm not supposed to eat sugar much. You know, you can't stay away from all sugar, but I try not to eat much sugar. But I used to, years ago, drink all kind of soft drinks. And, uh, but haagen ice cream, you know, that had that little pint. It would be fine to, if I just had a little bit of a, but I couldn't do it without eating the whole pint. You know, I'd start at first. I this is so. I mean, it's making me hungry just thinking about it. <laughs> I thought, man, this is fantastic. But then you get down to the, that that much left. It's like, oh, that's not even worth putting away. I might as well just finish it. <clears throat> and the next morning, I'd always think, oh man, why do I feel so sluggish? I should have been able to just eat a little bit, but I couldn't seem to do that real well. It's okay, you can laugh at me. I laugh at myself. But I still would like a little haagen ice <clears throat> We're going somewhere tonight. Maybe you have a little haagen ice cream. <clears throat> Go out to the store and buy it for me. Uh, okay, number four. Focus on your accomplishments rather than your failures. We all have things we've failed at at times, but we all have accomplishments. God sees us as a positive in a, in a positive light. If you see the glass is half empty rather than half full, it's easy to feel useless and even hopeless at times. I have heard people numerous times tell me how they just can't hardly get out of bed in the morning. They're so discouraged. Well, sometimes I have a hard time getting out of bed, but it's not because I'm discouraged. It's because my body's falling apart. It's okay. You can laugh at me. You'll, you'll be in the same boat one of these days. <clears throat> But it's not good when my wife laughs at me. <clears throat> okay. Number five. I only have six. I probably should have had seven. Six is not a good number, but it's the way it worked out. <clears throat> Work on forgetting past problems as much as you can. Mental health counselor Kathleen Power. She's from Sarasota, Florida. She said in an article in, in the Tribune newspaper in Sarasota, Florida once, she said an optimist, is a quote, has the ability to let go of the past while a pessimist holds on to everything. It's kind of like driving while looking through the rearview mirror. It looks like the road to where you're going, but really it's where you've already been. I think that's a good point. And number six, we need to do the best we can to just trust God. God's not going to let you down. God wants you in his kingdom. God wants to give you eternal life. He sees the fact that we struggle at times. He sees the fact that we are uh, far from the finished product. God loves us. God sees us in a light a whole lot more positive than we even see ourselves, even those of us who are the most optimistic. I could give <clears throat> examples of numerous situations that I've dealt with over the years of people that were really having a hard time. Just remember, you know, those little points I gave are things to think about. But just remember, God loves you. You know, we're going to the feast. <clears throat> it's a wonderful time. One of the most discouraging times I ever had was the second, not that I shouldn't say this, the most discouraging time I've ever had, but it was discouraging. The second time I ever went to the Feast of Tabernacles, I went by myself to St. Petersburg, Florida, when there's over 10,000 people. And I didn't really know hardly anybody there. And I just wish, would have given anything for somebody just said, would you like to go to dinner with us? And I would find myself where it was in the big hotel in St. Petersburg. I don't remember the name of the hotel, but it's a big hotel. A lot of people were staying there. I'd just go down and walk around the lobby just hoping somebody would, would maybe want to talk to me. So I'd go up to my room. I'd be there by myself. And when somebody just 
you know, look for opportunities. And I need to look for opportunities for anything you can do to encourage somebody. Again, this life, in one sense, is the most wonderful, precious, fantastic thing you could ever dream of. But in another sense, physically, physical life, there are a lot of bad things going on, and it's getting worse. So whatever we can do, whatever I can do, whatever you can do, <clears throat> to encourage one another. <clears throat> you know, James Horton, the man I began at the first, throwing those rocks at cars, it's not the way to handle things. People use all types of crutches. And again, I've said this many times, we're not the finished product. We're all in this together. Any way we can encourage one another, any way we can help one another, any way we can strengthen one another, God notices it when we are one that tries to the best of our ability to help each other. So I wish you all, we'll be here for trumpets, I wish you all a wonderful feast. I wish you all a wonderful time. I hope you have a wonderful feast. I'm trying to think of something funny to say, but I thought of something that's really funny, but I can't say it. <clears throat> Man, it was a good one, too. But anyway, I hope everyone has a wonderful feast. Uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, on trumpets and then after the feast.